I have to tell you, this is the first Sunday of 2019, and I am really pretty glad that 2018 is over. It was a sort of a problematic year for me. I made some bad decisions. I, I, I didn't kill anybody or anything, but it, you know, I made some decisions that were problematic for me. I'll just give you, a, 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 there's a, every year in November, there's a gathering of a group called the Society of Biblical Literature. It's where all the theology teachers gather together, and it is quite a roller coaster ride of excitement. And <clears throat> I was there in Denver. Uh, on the way there, I was in the Atlanta airport, and some a, a woman just ran into me and then started screaming at me like it was my fault. What's wrong with you? I, I don't know. And <laughs> then. I finally got to the hotel after being in the Atlanta airport, I mean the uh, Denver airport, which has all these signs about aliens living underground there, and it does, really. And, and so I got there to Denver, my friend was calling me because he wanted me to record something for a podcast, and I finally got to the right hotel after going to the wrong one, and there were all these, you know, there were several elevators, like five or six elevators, and I kept missing the elevator, it would open and close too fast. And so, uh, when one opened, it was starting to close again, I put my foot in there, you know, because that makes the elevator doors open up again. Unfortunately, uh, this particular elevator didn't seem to be equipped with that function. And the doors closed on my foot, and an alarm went off. And a guy came running up to me, saying, what's wrong with you? And again, I said, I don't know. I, you know, I had my nice shoes on, they were my dress crocs, almost got smashed by the elevator, but finally I made it. Then, later on in the conference, the faculty of Knox were getting together for dinner, so it was cold out, it was raining, uh, and it can be really cold if you're going around without any hair, so I had a hat, I had to wear a hat, and, you know, I had a coat on, all, uh, uh, and I was walking back and there's this big cross, wooden cross that somebody had carried out into the middle of the walkway and there's somebody on the microphone yelling. So I thought, that's, I gotta see that. And I walked over there and it was a woman uh, yelling out and she looked at me and she said, you, Mr. Fancy Dress and Fancy Hat, you're going to hell. Man, sorry I walked over there, I, and it wasn't even my best clothes. I didn't even have on my dress Crocs. It was, it was, it was a weird, weird time for me, and for some reason, I seemed to attract craziness, or, or maybe it's me, I, I don't know. But I can assure you of one thing, and that is that the person about whom we're to read today in the book of Ruth had a much more terrible year than I had. We'll read the book of Ruth, which is in many ways a sort of female version of Job, particularly for Naomi. And what had happened is that Naomi had lived in Bethlehem and there had come a famine. There's a little bit of a joke there because Bethlehem means house of bread. Baith is house, Elham is bread. And so there was a famine in the house of bread. She had, and her husband and her two sons, had moved across the Dead Sea over into a country called Moab because they had food there. And finally, she hears that Bethlehem has food again. And so she looks forward to going back to her home country. But something has happened to her in the time that she's moved to Moab. First of all, her husband has died. Her two sons have gotten married to Moabite women, and they have both died. And so Naomi recognizes that due to the patriarchal culture in which she lives, she is worse than nothing. She has no husband to protect her or to take care of her. She has no sons to protect her or take care of her. And yet, this book of Ruth is all about women and the difference that they can make in the world. 
So let's read this passage together in the book of Ruth. If you have a uh, Bible in front of you, there's in the pew, it's on page 222. That's the book of Ruth. And you can hold that open. We'll look at several things in the book. But in the first chapter, we'll read together the starting in the 14th verse and through the rest of the chapter. And this is what the text says to us. It says, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. That is Orpha and Ruth, the two daughters-in-law. They wept again and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more if anything, but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara in Hebrew means bitter. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is a fascinating book, the book of Ruth, for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is it's one of the few pieces of ancient literature written from the perspective of a woman and with a heroine instead of a hero. And you realize from all stories, if you've ever read, I'm sure you've read Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, you realize that in every story there's something keeping the hero from doing what he or she wants to do. And in this case, Ruth has a variety of things that are working against her. And Naomi has a variety of things that are working against her. And so I'd like for us for just a few moments to look quickly at the three main characters of this book. The first is Naomi. Naomi is at the lowest point in her life. She is husbandless, she is sonless, and she is moneyless. Really, she has absolutely nothing. And you know that in a patriarchal society, women were treated based upon their husband or their son. One of the things that we should realize is that the Bible always treats women better than their culture. It might seem odd to you the way that women are treated in the Bible, and you can't expect them to be treated in the way a 21st century woman would be, but the Bible is always treating women better than their culture is treating them. And so Naomi is heading back to Bethlehem, and she's hoping that she can sort of eke out a living doing the best that she can and maybe get enough to feed herself. And then Ruth says, I'll go with you. And she says, no, no, don't go with me. It'd be horrible for you. You're a foreigner, you're poor, you're a widow, and you're barren, you don't have any sons. All of those things will work against you. It would be far better that you go back to Moab and live there. And that's what her other son-in-law does, or daughter-in-law does, Orpha, which was Oprah's first name, believe it or not, and it was so hard to pronounce they changed it early when she was just a baby. But Orpha is not condemned for going back to her hometown. No, there's nothing wrong with that. But Ruth is held out to us as an example who is willing to give up everything, absolutely everything that she has simply to be true and gracious and kind to her mother-in-law. One of the, the most important words in the book of Ruth is this Hebrew word hesed. It means this covenant loyalty. And we see that covenant loyalty of Ruth to her mother-in-law in spite of the fact that she has absolutely nothing. 
Naomi comes back to Bethlehem, comes back to Israel uh, in geographical terms. Moab, if you were on the side of Israel in, in, in looking at the Dead Sea, straight across the Dead Sea, you would see Moab. And so when Naomi hears, well, there's food in Bethlehem now, she starts walking her way back. But when they get there, she says, call me bitter. Call me bitter because God has decided against me. Call me bitter because I have nothing and Almighty testifies against me. The interesting thing is, for the rest of the book, nobody calls her bitter. Nobody calls her bitter because every single little tiny incident in the book is testimony to the fact that God hasn't forgotten her. That as difficult as her past has been, God has not forgotten her and he is still looking out for her. And so Naomi thinks of herself as absolutely having nothing. And she realizes that bringing Ruth along with her will only complicate things. But finally, Ruth, after saying, I will go with you, your people will be my people, your land will be my land, your God will be my God, she goes with her. So the second character that we see in the book of Ruth is Ruth herself. Ruth follows her mother-in-law and she follows Israel's God, and that's very important. So in the second chapter of Luke, uh, of Ruth, what happens is that she starts to glean. And gleaning was there were, there were laws in Israel to take care of the poor and to take care of immigrants. Israel, there's a lot in the Bible about how we should treat the poor and how we should treat immigrants. Uh, Ruth comes in, <clears throat> excuse me, as an immigrant and she's allowed to glean. There, the people had big giant fields and the Hebrew Bible had specifications about how much of that field you were allowed to harvest. You had to leave some on the outer edges for the poor people to come and get. Gleaning was, in a sense, sort of a Israel's welfare program. You weren't going to get rich, but you weren't going to starve. You could glean and get basically enough for yourself. And so she goes to the the field of this man named Boaz and she starts to glean there, picking up whatever she could. The man Boaz notices her and he says to his harvesters, who is this girl? And they say, she's from Moab and she has worked all day. She has not even sat down once. And so <clears throat> Boaz calls her over and he says, here, eat lunch with us. And they give her more than she can eat. And so she wraps it up to take home to, to Naomi, sort of an Old Testament doggy bag kind of thing. And then she goes out and she gleans and Boaz has told his harvesters, leave more for her so that she can get lots and lots of, of, of barley. And she does. <clears throat> and when she goes back that night to see Naomi, Naomi says, what in the world has happened? You've brought me food. You've brought back more barley than anyone could have gleaned. And Ruth says, well, I was, I was there at the, the field of Boaz. And you can see in the back of her mind, Naomi's wheels start to turn because she remembers Boaz as being a relative of her husband. And so she says to Ruth, go back there. And after they're finished with this harvest party, it, what would happen is they would gather the grain together and throw it up in the air to get the, the chaff away from it. And then they would drink and eat and sleep out in the field <clears throat> so they could get a, an early start the next morning. And so Ruth follows what Naomi says. She goes there and she waits until Boaz, after having uh, drank some wine, she waits until he goes to sleep. And Naomi has told her, make sure it's Boaz, don't get the wrong guy, this could be fatal. And so <clears throat> she goes to Boaz and the text says, she uncovered his feet. Now, there are a few scholars who will argue that this is a, a euphemism for some kind of sexual contact. I think that's almost certainly not true based on a variety of things, both linguistic and historical. I think that what's happening here is that Ruth is uncovering his feet or his legs so that he gets cold and wakes up. 
And that's exactly what happened. Boaz gets cold, he wakes up, he sees this girl that are beside him, and essentially what she does is propose to him. She says, I'd like for you to do these things for me. I'd like for you to be my kinsman redeemer. And I would like for you to marry me because of the Leverite law. <clears throat> the kinsman redeemer would redeem back uh, fields that your father or your grandfather might have had to sell because of hard times. They would redeem it back and give it to the male in the family. Ruth is asking for that. And she's also asking that Boaz marry her as a result of a law that said, if, if a, uh, a man dies and his widow is childless, the brother of the man has a responsibility to marry her and, and give her a child. Now, Ruth is stretching the, those laws. She is pushing it to the very outskirts. But Boaz, amazingly enough, says, okay, I'll buy the field and I'll marry you. Now, there were a few things in the way, and you notice this at the beginning of chapter 4. There was someone who was a closer relative to Naomi's husband, Elimelech. And so Boaz says, I, I can't marry you until this person says they don't want to marry you. And so they, they go there to the city gate. That was where, where all the important people sat. And they sit around. And finally, this man comes up. And Boaz says, listen, there's this Moabite woman who was married uh, to the sons of Naomi. You can marry her if you want to. And the man realizes that marrying her would be a bad idea. He realizes that if he marries her, the and, and buys back that land, the land will not be his or his sons, it will be the, to the sons of Ruth and, and to Naomi. And so he says, you know, on thinking about it, I don't think I want to marry her. And there's this really unusual thing that happens there, like the second or third, fourth verse of, of chapter four, they engage in what is called a shoe covenant. So when the man says, no, I don't want to marry her, he gives Boaz his shoe, and Boaz takes off his shoe and gives it to the man. Probably Crocs, for all I know. You know, it's, it's a theme, see? And they, they have each other's shoe, and that is sort of this idea that, yes, I, I made a commitment that I was not going to marry that woman, and Boaz says, I made a commitment that I was going to take that woman. Boaz is the third, obviously, and the important character in the book, but certainly no, not anywhere near more important than Ruth or Naomi. And in marrying Ruth, Boaz does more than could have been asked of him. He knows that, Boab, that Ruth has nothing. He knows that she's poor. He knows that she's barren. She can't have children. He knows that if he buys this land back, if she does have children, the lamb will go to that child. And yet he does that because of this hesed, this covenant loyalty, this kindness, loyal kindness that she has. And the amazing thing that happens toward the end of the book is that Boaz marries Ruth and the Lord gives Ruth a son. It's this amazing thing. And Ruth, of course, calls her mother Naomi to take care of and nurse her grandson. And there's Naomi at the end of her life, having wanted to be called bitter because God had forgotten her, because God had done to her things that she could never get away from. Now, she is full. She is no longer bitter. As terrible as her life had been, God had worked together the circumstances to make her new life even better. It's an amazing thing. And what's even more amazing is that in the last few verses of the book, there's a genealogy. Sometimes we think genealogies are like the most boring parts of the Bible. We use all our speed reading techniques when we get to the genealogies, but this is just a small one. <clears throat> And the amazing thing is that Ruth's son, Obed, is an ancestor, perhaps even the grandfather of David, King David. 
And Matthew, in the very first chapter of his gospel, he has a genealogy. But there's something really different about Matthew's genealogy. It has women in it. Most genealogies, particularly genealogies of the ancient Near East, there weren't women. It was a patriarchal society. The man begot the man, begot the man, begot the man. And yet, out of nowhere, several women show up in Matthew's genealogy. And one of them is Ruth. Ruth, that woman who clung on to Naomi and said, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. It may be that you have had a difficult year. It may be that you, like Naomi, want to say, the Almighty has forgotten me, call me bitter. But it's not the end of the story. There was a famous hymn writer named William Cooper, C-O-W-P-E-R, but it's pronounced Cooper. And he had uh, some mental illness tried to commit suicide three times, at least three times. And one of those times, he got into a carriage and drove the horses toward a cliff, hoping that they'd all go over the cliff and he would die. But he fell asleep in the carriage, and when he woke up, he was back home. And when he went into his home after that, he wrote a poem later set to music. It's called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And this is just a small part of it, what Cooper says. He says, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. You see, everything changed for Ruth when she said, your God will be my God. She gives up the gods of Moab and holds to the true God of the universe, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Ruth and of Esther. There's a movie, you've probably seen it, called The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. It's a story of this <clears throat> hotel in India. And a group of people see the brochure about this, the best exotic Marigold Hotel, and they say to themselves, this is gonna be great, we go there. They book their trips, they get to the best exotic Marigold Hotel, and it is nothing like what the brochure says. It's broken down. Things don't work. And so one of the women on the trip, she grabs the brochure, she goes to the front desk, and she says, listen, I want to stay where this hotel is. And the clerk, unfazed, says to her, we have a saying in India. The saying is that everything will be all right in the end. If it is not yet all right, it is not yet the end. That's the message of the book of Ruth, that as bad as things might look for us now, the God Jehovah promises us that everything will be all right in the end. And though you may have faced some significant difficulties in the past year, maybe family difficulties, maybe physical difficulties, maybe health difficulties, I don't know. But I do know for absolute certain that we worship the God that Ruth worshiped. We worship the God who gave Ruth her son, Obed. We worship the God who brought Jesus Christ down to us through the lineage of a foreign Moabite girl who had nothing. She had nothing but her faith in the God of Naomi. And yet, in the end, everything was all right. And I promise you today, God tells us everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not yet all right, it's not yet the end.